test. Welcome in the name of the Lord. We are glad that you are worshiping with us this morning. There are a couple of announcements on the back of the bulletin and Barry has something to say about that. Good morning. So rather than have Carolee read the announcements and then me duplicate it, I'm just gonna be here first. Um, next Friday is Good Friday service here in the church at 7 p.m. and the confirmation class will be leading most of that service. It's going to be a really good time for Good Friday. Um, next Sunday is Easter Sunday and we are going to collect our one great hour of sharing fish from the children in Sunday school. So if you didn't get a fish before there's some in the back of the church and there's some in the Sunday school rooms. We are also collecting the one great hour sharing offering this week and next week. Um, if you'd like to make a contribution, there are envelopes in the pew backs and if they can't find one, there's some of those in the back of the church also. Uh, the, last Sunday we had the men's mission breakfast and we took in over $1,450. And after we pay our expenses, we'll have about $1,300 to send to Ukraine. And we're going to do that through the Presbyterian Church down in Sioux Falls that has a direct connection so the money can be sent almost immediately. Uh, lastly, on May 1st, Dwayne Mullen will be here to be the candidate to become our pastor. Um, he will do as much of the service as he's comfortable doing. But Elizabeth Fox will be here to do communion, and she will lead the uh, congregational meeting that will follow the service. And on that Sunday, church will start at 10 a.m. So hope to see a church packed full of people. Thanks. Okay, now will you stand and greet one another? Please join me in the call to worship. Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. He comes with joy and hope. Hosanna. Everlasting God, in your endless love for the human race, you sent our Lord Jesus Christ to take on our nature and to suffer death on the cross. 
In your mercy, enable us to share in his obedience to your will and in the glorious victory of his resurrection, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our first hymn this morning is All Glory, Laud, and Honor on page 265. May be seated. Our responsive reading comes from Psalm 916. The page number is page 868 in your pew Bibles. And I will read the odd verses and you respond with the even. Psalm 31, verse 9. Be merciful to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. 
my soul and my body with grief. Consumed by anguish, my years by groaning. My strength fails because of my affliction, and my bones grow weak. Because of all my enemies, I am the utter contempt of my neighbors. I am a dread to my friends. Those who see me on the street flee from me. For I hear the slander of many. There is terror on every side. They conspire against me and plot to take my life. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from my enemies and from those who pursue me. Okay, today's scripture reading, I will be reading from page 8, 20, 1827, Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11, if you'd like to follow along. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to, in de to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That it, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth and every tongue confess uh, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And now we'll sing the glory of Patri. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Lord, we confess that when we started this journey, it seemed like a fun idea. Walk the road with Jesus, we thought. But the journey has had many difficult times when our spirits have been challenged and tried. We have come to the time of entrance into the holy city. We want everything to be wonderful for you to conquer all those things that threaten us and our peace. We want you to do what we direct. Forgive us, Lord, when we place our fears and ignorance before your love. Help us to look again at the many ways in which we can be a blessing to others through serving them and you. Release us from our panic and mistrust and help us to place our lives solely in your hands. Amen. We will now have a time of personal reflection. Rejoice, the Lord has come into your presence. You are the beloved ones of God. Know that God walks with you through this parade and time of celebration and in all the times ahead. Amen. Are there any joys or concerns today? I know we have visitors. Eli, you want to? Welcome.
Any other joys? Oh, happy birthday. Any other birthdays today? Yes, Donna's birthday. Tell Donna happy birthday, okay? All right. Okay. Any other joys besides birthdays? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. Are there any concerns? Yes. And what what was his first name? I've always known him by Gundy. But it's Okay. We'll keep them in our prayers. Yes. By what? I'm sorry. Tony. Okay. I think we should also continue to pray for the people of Ukraine. Do you know her name? The family of the little girl who was killed by Volga. Okay. Well, that's awful. All right. If there are no other concerns, um, let's go ahead and pray. Father God, we uh, come to you at this time with some joys and concerns, and um, I would like to lift up um, the joys that we have of Cody and Tina and their little baby being here, and birthdays, the, those who were, less, who were men mentioned, and also thank you so much for us having a, a possible pastor come. And we really appreciate that. We've been praying for a while. Our concerns are for the family of Tony Gunderson. And um, please wrap your arms around them and their grief. Also for the people of Ukraine, we still pray. And to the war is, is not a good thing. We, we pray that you will be there with the people. Also for the family of the little girl who lost her life by Volga and um, please blessed are those who mourn and keep them wrap your arms around them too and now would you join me in the prayer that um, the Lord taught us our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, Bruce, I have a question for you. Would you like me to read the, the scripture now, or do you want the kids back there now? So. Okay. I would like all the children to start going to the back of the church because we have something for you to do for Palm Sunday. While you are going, I'm going to go ahead and read the scripture from Luke 19, verses 28 through 40. If you'll go ahead and just start going back there. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill, called Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. 
If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down, the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of our Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the, in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. So. So are they supposed to say Hosanna? They are. We're just going to, you guys spread all the way down, down this side. I will cry out Hosanna. And we want to hear, we want you to be loud. This might be the only time we ever ask you to be loud in church service. But okay. We want you to praise the name. We just say Hosanna as loud as you can. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Come on, come on. Wave your branches. Come on, wave your branches. Wave your <laughs> you can come on up here. Bruce just Bruce is coming. I'm coming. All right, guys. Hosanna, let's keep waving the branches. Come on, wave your branches. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. <laughs> Hosanna, you guys can keep looping. Go where you want to go. Why don't you go around? We'll go around that way, we'll go on the back, and then you can go find your seat. But we've got to keep saying Hosanna the whole time, Hosanna, right? Hosanna! 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 Oh, yeah, that's right. I got taken. You can take those back. You can keep the branches. Go back to find your parents. I know if it was me, maybe I'm giving you an idea. I used to smack my brother with him when we were <laughs> sitting in the church. But There you go. Everybody found a home. There we go. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a colt, the foal of a donkey. That was Zechariah. That was Zechariah 9, 9. That was written 500 years before the time of Christ. Where it was prophesied that the king would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. And even though that was in the scriptures, it was maybe not the way people anticipated Jesus would show up. Kids, you did a great job. We haven't been able to do that for a few years. I don't know if it's probably 2019 maybe since the last time we, we did Palm Sunday. But sometimes I think um, when we think of parades and the loudness and the festivities, you know, maybe we have a small town South Dakota homecoming parade in mind. And I think this was at a different level, a different volume. I lived in... I lived in New Orleans for a while, and Mardi Gras was its own crazy animal. And honestly, after I went and experienced some of it once, I kind of left town during that week because it was a little bit, a little bit more than, than I wanted to be part of. But I remember I took my mother-in-law once. My wife was home with our newborn daughter. My, my daughter was actually born uh, during Mardi Gras in New Orleans, so we, we consider that to be part of her, the reason she's as crazy as she is. But, but we... Uh, I took my mother-in-law. She wanted to go to see a Mardi Gras parade, and I had to warn her. I said, Ma, so this isn't like small-town parades where somebody will throw out a little bit of candy and you may or may not get something. This is, they come at about a whole, you know, 12 feet above you, and when that float comes, it's a downpour. 
It's an overload. It's, it's overwhelming to the system. And they don't just throw candy. There's all kinds of food and toys and cool stuff. Uh, I remember one time they, I was at a parade and they threw out, uh, there was a rubber chicken that caught my eye and it was flying by my head. And so I reached up and I caught the rubber chicken with one hand, but somebody, I felt somebody grab the back end of it uh, over my shoulder. So instinctively I, I pulled down and across my body, but he didn't let go and he went flying out into the road. And I immediately thought, all right, now I'm going to have to, now I'm going to have to fight because I just threw this guy in the road. But he got up and I, I said, I'm sorry, you can have the chicken. He said, man, you want it? Fair and square, we high-fived and went about the parade. But when the, when, the, when the float came by my mother-in-law, I warned her. I said, if there's something that you see that you like, put your foot on it. You've got to protect your head. <clears throat> well, the first thing that came, it went on her feet, and she went down to pick it up, and she just got swamped with stuff. So I had to stand over my mother-in-law as the Mardi Gras goods rained down around her. And so this may not have been a Mardi Gras parade in the celebration, but I think the intensity and the loudness and the excitement um, was something that we probably don't see matched in a South Dakota parade. And it was the beginning of a week that changed the world. These eight days, from the Sunday of Palm Sunday to the Sunday of the Resurrection, which we call Easter, have been the topic of numerous writings, films, debates, documentaries. If you look around the world and you travel, you see that this week and the events of this week have inspired some of the greatest painters and architects, musicians. And so to try and calculate the impact on our culture of what happened on this week 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem is really impossible. And it's harder still to try to calculate the impact on human lives, all the lives from that day till this day that have been impacted by the result of what happened with Jesus on the cross would be impossible to calculate. But as we enter into this week, one of the things I know that I do, and it just happens to be the way that the, the week works, is that on Sunday we celebrate. On Sunday we celebrate. The kids were celebrating the arrival of Jesus, the arrival of the King in Jerusalem. On next Sunday, we'll celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. But in between this week, there's a lot of stuff that goes on. A lot of it's pretty heavy and dark and intense. And we get to that with our Monday, Thursday service and our Good Friday services. But there's a lot of stuff that goes on in this week that sometimes gets lost just because of where it falls in the week. So I wanted to just give us a summary, just remind us really quickly of what happens this week. So Palm Sunday, Jesus rides into Jerusalem on the donkey, fulfilling the prophecy that I just read from Zechariah 9.9. That next day on Monday, he walks into the Jerusalem temple, and he sees the money changers. He sees the business that's been going on there, and he gets angry. He makes a whip, and he drives out the animals. He flips over the tables, and he causes... A lot of chaos and, and mess. Imagine just livestock running loose with people in an indoor space. Um, it's loud. It's chaotic. Uh, it gives you a picture of Jesus that I think sometimes we, we don't focus on. But there are things that made him angry. And one of the things was people getting in, getting in between other people's connection with God. Putting rules on them that weren't meant to be there. On Tuesday, Jesus taught in parables. He warned the people against the Pharisees, and he predicted the destruction of the temple. That same place that he was just clearing out, he predicted the destruction of it. On Wednesday, we don't have anything. There's nothing recorded about what happens Wednesday and what we would now call Holy Week. We can maybe guess, we can maybe think that based on all the stuff going on, that maybe this was a, a day that there wasn't a lot of public stuff going on. It was a time of gathering up maybe some energy to finish the week well, but we just don't know what happens Wednesday. Thursday, in an upper room, Jesus celebrated the Passover meal with his disciples. The Passover was what everybody was gathered in Jerusalem for. We call it Holy Week. At that time, they called it Passover. It was a week-long celebration commemorating the Exodus but he gave it new meaning. The shed blood of the perfect lamb that was 
painted onto the doorpost to save the people from the angel of death would now be remembered differently as they would remember the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus that was poured out to save all of us. And later that evening in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus agonized in prayers. He invited his disciples to come with him and to stay awake. And as we know, they got tired and they fell asleep. And Jesus was so agonized that he sweat blood. Friday was the day where he was betrayed, arrested, imprisoned, deserted by those closest to him. He suffered false trials, denial, condemnation, torture, sentencing. And then he carried his own cross to Golgotha, the hill that means the place of the skull, where he was crucified in a common Roman execution technique called crucifixion, crucified between two other common criminals. On Saturday, Jesus lay dead in a tomb bought by a rich man named Joseph. But on Sunday, the tomb was rolled away, and Jesus was alive. He appears to Mary, he appears to Peter, he appears to two disciples on the road to Emmaus, which is one of my favorite stories about Jesus. And then he comes and he appears to the 11 disciples that are gathered in a locked room, and they're in a locked room because they're terrified about what might come next. They're sure that they're being looked at, looked at, looked for by the local officials and something violent might happen to them. And Jesus, after appearing to the disciples or the disciples on the Emmaus Road, appears into the room. And one of the things he asks is if they have something to eat. Just an amazingly, I think, playful way that he appears and then does something normal in the midst of something supernatural. But at that point, his resurrection is established as truth and later confirmed by many. And that hope that we have had and we have in Jesus became a reality that day. But today we celebrate Palm Sunday as we look forward to Easter next week. And the significance of Palm Sunday is that this is the day where Jesus proclaims himself to the world as the Messiah. The Jews were gathered in large numbers in Jerusalem for the Passover, and Jesus chose this day to officially present himself as the Messiah. Up until this time, as we read scriptures, there are many times where maybe Jesus healed somebody, and he says, hey, but don't go tell anybody. Don't go tell people what has been done for you here. He wasn't ready yet for the official proclamation of who he was as the Messiah. But now it's time. Now the time has come, they've been preparing, he's been leading his guys now for three years, and the time for presentation is at hand. And so Jerusalem will be, to use a modern term, this is Jesus' big reveal. And the big reveal, or the reveal, is a, is a term in storytelling where we reveal this moment that's like in the, the path of the story, there's pieces that are maybe not tied together, but all of a sudden there's this re reveal, there's this aha moment where all of a sudden the light comes on, we see where this is going, there's this big piece of the puzzle that's maybe shown to us or a twist that we didn't know about was, was shown up. This is the big reveal. It's the aha moment. This is what Palm Sunday is for Jesus. So Jesus is headed to Jerusalem. He has come up from Jericho, and as he approaches Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sends two of his disciples ahead, saying this. He says, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you'll find a colt there, one that's never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here, and if anyone asks you why you're untying it, say, the Lord needs it. I think that's one of those things as you stop and you read the stories, those pictures of the people that owned the cult. When these guys come, when the disciples come and they untie it, the owners say, what are you doing? Why are you untying my cult? And the only story we have is that they tell the guy the Lord needs it. Now, we don't know who this guy is. We don't know if he knew who Jesus was. There's no more to the story. It's just released. But there's something in this story that shows when God has a plan, when God has something he's designed that things are going to unfold, maybe not the way we would design 
maybe they're not. If we sat down as a planning committee and laid out this day, you know, we might have wanted to get permission first or sign some forms. Um, Jesus just prepares the hearts of these guys, sends his disciples out to go get the colt, and it's released to them. And it's a colt that's never been ridden. You understand the value of this kind of an animal if you work in livestock at all. But what's the point and what's the significance of there being a donkey at all, right? Because as we read the Bible, as we read Scripture, names have meaning, places have meaning, sequences have meaning, everything has meaning. And there aren't things that are random. As you start at the beginning of the Scripture and you work your way through, there's a reason that it's a donkey and not something else. Because at this time, at this moment, with the Romans occupying, all of Israel was waiting for the Messiah, but they were waiting for a political revolutionary. They were waiting for someone to come in on a horse with a sword and the power of God overthrow the Roman oppressors. The scriptures were there for them to see, but they somehow missed Zechariah's prophecy. In the days of Zechariah, when that prophecy was written, though, the king, when a king came riding on a horse into an area occupied by his enemies, when he came riding on the horse, it was a declaration of war. He was coming in to declare war on his enemies. It was a, a picture of his intent as he was walking in. However, when a king came riding on a donkey, he was announcing an intention of peace, that he came in peaceful terms, that he came to make peace with his enemies, not declare war on them in that moment. So the entry of Jesus on a cult is a prophetic declaration of Jesus' purpose and his mission, not just for the Jews of that day, but for all of humanity, that he came to bring peace. A peace that the world without Christ will never know. But that word peace is not a strong enough word. It's not the way that it's translated. As we look back in Hebrew, then translate into Greek, the word is shalom. And maybe if we study, we hear this word shalom also. Often it has a rich, a rich meaning. It's a greeting that's used for both hello and goodbye. And it does mean peace. But according to Strong's concordance, it means this. It means completeness. It means wholeness. It means welfare. It means peace. It doesn't describe an absence of conflict. It describes a presence of God in the midst of your life and what the result of God in the middle of all that looks like. Colossians 1, 19 through 20, Paul kind of describes it this way. He says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on a cross. To make peace, to bring shalom, to bring completeness, to bring wholeness through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus had prepared his whole life for this day. Everything was pointing to this week. And as we got closer, we could see that that Jesus couldn't be knocked off track. And so Jesus advanced down the west side of the Mount of Olives towards the city, and he was welcomed by the crowd as their Messiah. The loudness, the loud hosannas and the, the waving of the palm branches. And the people threw their cloaks on the road, forming a royal carpet as a means of respect for the entering king. And the whole crowd of believers began to joyfully praise God for all the miracles they had seen and for the hope that they had in him, saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Which this passage from Luke is a direct quote from Psalm 118, 26. Nothing is random, nothing is without purpose. Even the things that are being proclaimed have connection back to the stories and the scriptures. 
But the fact that Jesus was welcomed this way greatly troubled the Pharisees, greatly troubled the religious rulers, the religious elites of this day. And to this, and so they asked Jesus to rebuke his followers. And to this, Jesus replied, I tell you this, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Imagine that the stones of the rocks crying out, blessed is the king who comes in the name of of the Lord. And all the Gospels where this Palm Sunday story is recorded, this is the only place where we see this objection by the Pharisees in Jesus' response. This was a triumphant entry of Israel's king that had been prophesied, anticipated. The excitement could not be contained. But Jesus is saying, even if it could be, if the people refuse, this time has been ordained by God, and if they won't cry out, very creation itself will cry out in this moment. Nothing can stop what's coming is what Jesus is telling these guys. All of history is preparing for the single event when Jesus would be declared, declared king. And Jesus takes us on a journey to help us understand <clears throat> that this plan was put in place by God and man and the rulers and the most extreme powers of the earth, which in this case would be the Romans, Nobody can stand in the way of what God's going to do. So in this day that we celebrate, in this moment, Jesus comes on a donkey. He comes to bring shalom. But this isn't the end of the story. As we look forward into Revelation 6-2, we see that moment where Jesus will be presented as one riding on a horse. Revelation 6-2 says this. It says, I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. And that is when the kingdom of God shall come in its fullness, a kingdom of shalom, a kingdom of restoration, of wholeness, where every tear will be wiped away, every wrong made right. That day is coming. As believers, we're somewhere in between the story of the resurrection and the return of the king. But we have confidence in what's coming. But what's even more beautiful later in Revelation, the palms show up again. The palm branches show up again. Revelation 7, 9 through 12 says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a, in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell down on their faces before the throne and they worshiped God saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Palm Sunday says to us, it's God's heart that nobody be left out of the kingdom. That it's his plan that he is orchestrating. He does give us choice to participate. But he says even the creation will cry out. See your king, God says to us. Palm Sunday, he's riding in on a donkey. He's coming to bring restoration. Restoration of that relationship with the father that's been broken since the fall. Since the fall to this point, there is a separation between man and God. The significance of the donkey is that Jesus comes in peace, but to restore the peace between God and his children. To mend the separation, to remove the separation between God and people. The Messiah comes to reconcile all of us to God through his blood. There is no longer separation from this point forward. We've lived our whole lives on this side of the cross, so we don't really understand the separation that occurred in that time, but this is the significance of the peace. And going forward, there is now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. So as Jesus entered Jerusalem that day, he could see what lay ahead. He could see the weak. He, maybe he enjoyed the celebration that day as a, as a respite, as, as seeing his people come together, but he knew what his assignment was. He knew what was coming that week. 
And he was able to look forward to the cross, but he was able to look through the cross to the resurrection and what happened on the other side. He was able to look forward to the time of his ascension where he would be restored to his father. He was able to look forward to the time of Pentecost where the Holy Spirit was poured out on the disciples and they were commissioned and released into the earth with the assignment to be ambassadors for Christ, an assignment that, that we carry now today to bring the message of the gospel to the ends of the earth. And he was able to look forward to that time in 2002 where we would be gathered here at Castlewood praising the name of Jesus some 2,000 years later and look forward past that to that end where the king comes back on the horse and the restoration and the kingdom of God comes in its fullness and the evil is vanquished forever. And those of us that are of the kingdom gather and sing Hosanna, praise the Lord forever. So as we go forward into this week, it's an amazing time to reflect on just what is this all about? Why, why did a hundred and some people a year, a hundred some years ago, people decide this was important enough to take their time and their money to build this? There was something that moved them to build this. And it wasn't just that they needed a place to gather. There was a power in the gospel. There's a power in the message of the cross. And I just invite us to just spend some time this week reflecting on what this week means as we look forward to celebrating the resurrection on Sunday. Let's pray. God, we thank you for all of the moments that you've recorded for us that are seeped in history and seeped in, in prophecy um, and just allowing us the opportunity to pull some of these things together and understand which, what that week means to us even today. That the cross has brought us to you. There is no longer separation. The door of heaven is open to us. Precious blood has been spilt on our behalf, and we can walk in the fullness and confidence of being sons and daughters of the Most High God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We will sing hymn 267. Will the ushers come forward to receive our tithes and offerings? God, we know that your word says that you love a, a cheerful giver, so let us give cheerfully, knowing that you're the one that gave us seed to sow. 
And I pray that this seed would be sown and reap a harvest of abundance. In Jesus' name, amen. And I'll sing him 268. And now as we head into the rest of Holy Week, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace.